All right, so I'm Bing Kim. I'm a PhD candidate, as Aurora mentioned, from MIT. And CSAIL, it's a computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory at MIT. I work with Cynthia Rudin and Julie Shah, and the work that I'm presenting today is, is joint work with uh, two, my two advisors. So today I'm going to talk about Bayesian case model. It's a generative approach for case-based reasoning and prototype classification. So before I go on to jumping right onto the talk, I thought I would introduce myself a little bit. So I used to make robots. I used to make multiple robots, one on the ground, the other one on the, on, in the air. And then I realized, well, these robots break down pretty very often. So I finished my master's in robotics, and I went off to design computers. I worked at MathWorks for a couple of years as a software engineer before I coming, come back to MIT to start my PhD in machine learning. So my research interest is to make machine learning models uh, that make sense to humans and can make sense of humans. And this comes from a really simple goal of my research and my work in general, that I wanted to do something useful. I want people, this amazing tool called machine learning, I want people to use it to solve their own problems. But this is not easy. Um, in particular, I'm interested in having normal people who doesn't really know machine learning being able to use machine learning. This isn't easy because uh, to be able to, to convince them to use this potentially good hammer, we need to convince them this is doing something that makes sense. For disaster responders, for example, for these people, there's no way they're going to make important decisions who's going to, who you're going to save first just because computers tell you that that's the best answer. So uh, first way, way to make this machine learning tool useful is to uh, make transparent systems such that humans can understand it makes sense to humans. Also, this hammer called machine learning isn't perfect. There are years of accumulated experience of human domain experts, such as disaster responders, that machine learning, machine learning models just don't have. So on the top of that, we need to make sure that machines can make sense of humans so that we can incorporate their feedback back to machine learning systems. There are lots of different ways to achieve this goal, and the, here are two things that I've tackled. One is building machine learning models that could provide insights and very intuitive explanation about the machine learning results. And second, making this system that could interact with the humans so that we can incorporate their feedback back into machine learning systems. Breaking down my research even farther down, far, farther, uh, I worked on these three different areas. Today's talk, I'm going to mostly talk about number two, which is a communication from machine to humans. How can we provide intuitive explanation from machines to humans? But I want to touch really briefly on what I did for the number one. Um, this is how we can make sense of humans without machines getting involved. So if humans are discussing, in particular, uh, discussing their plans for disaster response, uh, can we infer what they are talking about? And this is to make sure that if machines have suggestions as to you know, better strategies, then we need to know what humans are talking about first so that we know when to make the right suggestions and what kind of suggestions we need to make. So the first part of my PhD work is about given a dialogue about making plans for disaster response, can we infer what humans finally agreed upon? So we show that that's possible. And then the next step was, OK, well, now how can we intuitively communicate machines' suggestions back to humans in a very intuitive way? And that's the talk that I'm going to give today here. So first thing to think about when we want to communicate with humans is to think about how humans think. In particular, I'm interested in improving decision makings for you know, domain, expert, domain experts such as disaster responders. Um, when humans are making tactical decision, uh, a lot of reach, there's a lot of rich literature exists that shows that humans make exemplar-based reasoning. And this is just a fancy word for humans recognize the new incident, for example, as a type of previous incidents that they have dealt with and apply the solutions, modif modified solutions to their new incident. And in particular, skilled firefighter does exactly this. 
they have a new fire and they identify, oh, I've seen this, something like this in 1996, let me modify my solution and apply to that. That was successful, let's do it. And so idea is to, to for machines to, that can better support human decisions, we need to present the information in the form that humans think. So that's where we came about, um, let's use examples to explain machine learning results to humans. This is not a new idea. This has been very successfully uh, that um, studied classical AI called case-based reasoning. So case-based reasoning is very, a very fancy name for something quite simple, actually. We do it every day. Uh, let me give you an example about, of case-based reasoning. Let's say your child is sick. He's having a fever, and he's having, he is nauseous and having some coughs. Uh, these are what the observed variables. You're, you're observing these symptoms of your child. Then what you do is find the illness that is closest to the, to the symptoms that you see, in, in which case uh, here it might be flu. Then you apply the solution for flu to your child. There's uh, uh, routine and, and feedback loops in, in, this, in, in the details of case-based reasoning, but this is a basic simple idea that we actually do uh, on a daily basis. So this powerful idea has been um, has achieved a decent success in, in healthcare and a lot of manufacturing and other real domains. But CBR comes with limitations. CBR does not leverage global patterns of data. So for example, there is uh, maybe food poisoning in the cafeteria of the school that your child is going to temporarily. Maybe last week something happened. So a lot of kids are sick with that, and you know it. But CBR doesn't know how to leverage that current trend to and incorporate that in, in, in their decision making. And also it always requires labels. So you need to know the previous solution, what was successful and what wasn't successful. And also it does not uh, scale to complex problems. I don't know how many people watch Dr. House. It's a medical drama. No, okay, good. <laughs> so it's a, it's a medical drama for those who, who haven't watched it. It's a medical drama about this genius doctor who can figure out mysterious uh, disease, patients with mysterious symptoms and diseases and diagnose the, to find the right, um, what's wrong with this patient. Um, and the solution space that Dr. House is searching for is huge. It's very complex domain. But this doctor is depicted as a genius for, or for a reason, because normal humans are not really good at doing this. Matching, when, when data becomes very high dimensional, matching and finding the closest solution and applying that solution, uh, closest staleness and applying that solution to the newest incident, humans are not very good at it. And neither does the CBR. It quickly loses the intuitive power when it becomes a um, very complicated uh, system, complicated data and complicated problems. All right, so let me introduce our approach. Uh, we call it Bayesian case model. It is, leverage, it is about leveraging power of prototypes, which, which are basically examples, and subspaces, which are basically hot features, important features, to explain machine learning results. So technically, we combine Bayesian generative models with case-based reasoning and, and make Bayesian case model. These are just fancy way of saying we're trying to explain something complicated using examples because we believe that's powerful and that's just the way uh, that humans think when they're making decisions. So before I jump in right onto the model, let me give you an example, because I've been advocating examples. So I hope you're not too hungry, because here are delicious looking many dishes that I'm showing you. If, uh, can anyone identify clusters um, in, the, in these, these dishes? Mexican food and desserts. That's what I'm looking at the desserts. Good, yeah, these are all really good answers. There's Was one more crisps? question. Yeah, okay, well, you're really, you're really fast and you're really good at this. Okay, yes, so there are three clusters. You might be the fastest person I've, I've given up this talk a few times and like no one gets it this, this fast. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. So first cluster is Mexican food. You see quesadilla, enchiladas, nachos, and uh, salad, taco salad. And second cluster is the crepe cluster. It's got savory crepes and some sweet crepes and basic crepes. And the third cluster is dessert. In particular, it, it has berry and chocolate. Uh, so case, Bayesian case model 
performs joint inference on explanations, which are prototypes and subspaces, and cluster labels, which are these. So it's a clustering algorithm that also learns explanations at the same time. So these are cluster results. Let me show you how the explanation look like. These are the explanations provided by case ba uh, Bayesian case model. First cluster is, like you said, Mexican food, but maybe someone, we happen to have an easy name for that cluster, Mexican food, but a lot of data points, we don't really have that easy name that we can quickly summarize that cluster. So what I can explain this cluster in, in, instead is by asking, oh, have you eaten tacos? If you eaten tacos, um, the cluster A is like tacos, but the important features that you need to pay attention to are salsa, sour cream, and avocado. Second cluster is like basic crepe, but what, what important features are in that cluster are flour and eggs. And the third is chocolate berry tart cluster, and chocolate strawberries are the important ingredients. So this orange marked as orange, these are subspaces, the important hot features, and these are the prototypes that we learned. So this is the way that BCM provides explanations. Uh, technically, um, prototypes are defined as a quanti-essential observation that best represents the cluster. And subspace is a set of important features that characterizes the clusters. So let's go a little um, more in depth of how this model works. I'm going to first explain how the clustering part works. And, but remember, we're doing joint inference on, on everything. So these all three things happens at the same time. But uh, let me just first talk about how the clustering part works, and then I'm going to talk about how we, we're learning explanations. So first, clustering part. Uh, BCM leverages models that is well studied uh, in, 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 in generate, Bayesian generative model uh, community, which is a mixture model. Mixture model can, uh, is, is popular, has been very popular to model the underlying distribution because of its flexibility. In, in, a, in a short way of explaining which your model is, instead of if, when you have a data and you have multiple features for a data point, you're going to assign a label for each of these features instead of assigning one data to one cluster, boom, and you're done. So that allows you a little more flexibility. And this has been well studied uh, lots of efficient inference algorithms have been developed to solve, to do the inference on the mixture model, such as LDA, Lettinger shell allocation, is one of the generative model that, that leverages the power of mixture model. Um, mathematically, it's, it's leveraging the power of conjugate prior, multinomial, and Dirichlet pair. But before that, let me, let me give you an example of how mixture model will look like in our running example of the recipe data. Let's say you have a crepe that is Mexican inspired. You have some of the ingredients, avocado, salsa, but you have the crepe as a base. In this case, what a mixture model is going to do is label each of these features for, to, to, and assign them in, to a different cluster. So avocado and salsa might be cluster A, Mexican food, and the base crepe will be cluster B, the crepe cluster. If you have a sweet crepe that has uh, happens to have a chocolate and berry in it, then it's going to assign some of the ingredients to, be cl to cluster C and some of the ingredients to cluster B. So when you look at this one data point, you have some sort of distribution over clusters. So this guy has one B and two Cs. And this variable is explicitly modeled in the generative model, and that's the pi variable cluster distribution. So A data point is now not just A cluster, but is a distribution over clusters. And this variable is, can be used to um, convert your clustering algorithm into classification method such that often uh, used for evaluation. This type of evaluating this clustering models are firstly introduced by David Bly's first paper in uh, original paper of LDA. So we're going to use this to compare our clustering uh, models performance with other, other models. Another thing that mixture model offers is uh, this hyperparameter alpha, or, or any other name that you want to call this alpha too. What this alpha gives you is uh, flexibility of deciding how many different clusters you want to have per data point. 
So for example, in the previous example, maybe you want to see this, you just see this as a dessert, and you want this data to be mostly really cluster C. Then you can change this hyperparameter alpha such that it would indirectly encourage that behavior. So that's the hyperparameter alpha that we have another control over. All right, so I'm moving on to the learning the explanation part. Uh, the explanations are again uh, represented as prototypes and subspaces. And let me first explain what, what are the prototypes. So the prototypes are defined in, in our generative model, generative story, it's simply a uniform distribution over all possible data points. And this is actually the key why BCM is intuitive. So as in, compared to, uh, as opposed to making a mock sample data point, something that didn't exist in your data, data set and making up um, and presenting it to the humans, we actually select a data point that was given to us by the humans. So for example, you're a disaster responders. I will, instead of making up a, an averaged cluster case or incident, I will, I will tell you, okay, well, cluster A is this case that you experienced in 1996. There's a high story, multi-story building. It was a high wind. And the human experts are like, oh, yeah, okay, I remember that. I, I remember what the case was. And then I, I say, okay, well, the cluster is, this cluster is about that incident that you had, but important features are this and that. So, so, so using the fact that we're using the actual data point is actually one of the key why BCM is intuitive. What's the part about the uniform distribution? It simply models, you know, we're not going to favor one data point over others when we're in the generative model story. But in the, in the inference step, right, it will benefit, it will favor the ones that better represents the cluster. So, Let's see, let's see how, how subspaces are learned and, and modeled. Subspaces are simply a binary variable, one for important features and zero for not important features. Uh, we, decide to, we decided to incorporate the subspaces idea using the fee variable that explains the cluster. So the way that subspaces, this uh, omega s is incorporated in, into, in the cluster in our model is using this g function, which I will explain very shortly and making that g function to be a hyperparameter for Dirichlet distribution that phi is sampled from. And phi is the variable that describes the cluster s. Phi s describes the cluster, uh, cluster s. So let's look at what g function look like. So g function looks like this. It's a one way of describing, one way of defining g function. It looks complicated, but it's really nothing but making, we're going to uh, put same bump for all the possible features, except if that feature is important and you happen to have the same feature value as the prototype, then we're going to raise the bump. So you're gonna have something like this if you have features that matches up with your prototypes. So if you have a data point that is same feature values as your prototype, then it's just going to end up with a higher score. And therefore, in the Gibbs sampling step, it will going to uh, uh, um, have a higher probability of getting sampled. And this is one way of defining function g. You can define, this is um, a way of measuring the similarity. You can define this g function to be anything. You could, for example, incorporate a loss function or any other kernel, whichever you like. But this is the simplest form that we picked for this, this work. Okay, so when I, uh, when I talk to people about interpretable models, they, they have questions. It's not just about performance and predictability, it's also about a lot of other questions have to follow, right? We have to show a lot of things. Uh, first thing to, uh, to answer, um, the first question that I get is, before anything, let's just make sure that this model you built makes sense. So you claim to learn these prototypes and subspaces. Does it actually make sense? Does it actually work? And then once that's done, okay, well, interpretability is great, but what are we paying for? What are we sacrificing but for this interpretability? And lastly, does this really make sense to humans? Have you verified with actual humans that this thing actually makes sense to humans? So I'll show you, answer these questions as a part of uh, uh, presenting the results. So first, data set that we tried our BCM on is a recipe data. 
This is a publicly available data set. It's a part of a computer cooking contest. Uh, data set where each data point is a consist of ingredients. So it's a recipe data set, but the instructions of the uh, how to make the dish isn't there. It's just a list of ingredients. And we ran BCM on this, and this is what it learned. It learned uh, for the cluster that looks like a pasta cluster, it selected that urban tomato in pasta is the prototypical dish of pasta cluster. And it learned oil, pasta, pepper, and tomato to be important features, the subspaces. For the cluster what it, that looks like chili cluster, it learned genetic chili recipe and selected beer, chili powder, and tomato as subspaces. And if you're like my co-author who told me when I showed these results to her, she was like, Bean, beer is weird. Beer shouldn't be in chili. Why is beer in chili? And I told her, well, have you, I mean, if you cooked chili, if you haven't been putting beer in your chili, you should. <laughs> it makes a lot of difference. So beer is there. You, have to, you, you should. Beer is a great ingredient for pretty much any, any dish, really. <laughs> Microwave brownies are selected as uh, the prototypical dish for the brownie cluster. And it learned baking powder and chocolate as subspaces. Punch cluster was an interesting one. Because it has such a variety of ingredients when you're making punch, it, it, it BCM was learning at each, well, I'm doing GIP sampling to jump, jump, jump a few slides ahead. I'm doing GIP sampling at each GIP sampling. There are a lot of modes to, to jumping back and forth uh, from. And, but what BCM settled on is what, what to me looks reasonable, or it picked up juices, it, the base ingredient for, for punch, punch, punch dishes. All right, so second data set that I ran BCM on is handwritten digit, yeah? Where, where the, I mean, you showed four clusters, are they exhaustive or like these are four of the many clusters you have? That's a good question. So we selected the recipes that we know we might be able to identify. Remember, this is a clustering algorithm, right? So when the results are there, we don't have a ground truth of like what's, what, what is this cluster, right? It might put, uh, say, pasta and pizza cluster together because they're, they're similar compared to other data points that, that we had in the data set. So what we did is that we collected the subset of this recipe data set that we know that there are, there we, when, when, it, when BCM learns something, we can identify each cluster, what that is, and then I'm showing you there. So you're showing those four clusters here. I'm wondering why like, tomato is picked up as an important feature while salt is not. I don't see salt in brownies or punch. Yes. Salt is not picked as a... Yeah. So what? It, it actually, it, that's the right thing that BCM did, that salt did, it did not pick the salt. Because if you look at it, salt is everywhere, right? Salt is here, salt is there, salt is there. No, that's what it, oh, right. it's there. The yeah, yeah. So it's, it's kind of common oh. ingredient across the cluster, so it shouldn't pick it. So we also ran BCM on a handwritten digit data set. And this is a digitally written data set. This is a, a, a pretty widely used data set by, uh, provided by Sam Ruiz in, in his website. It's, um, it's dig digitally written, so which is why it's a white and black or, con uh, or flipped. So these are the zero and other zero digits from zero to nine. And this is the results uh, when we ran BCM. I'm showing you as the Gibbs sampling iteration goes. So in case you're not familiar with the Gibbs sampling, uh, what you want to see, it's an iterative method to find a good solution. So you're doing some sort of random walk in the solution space. So what you would like to see if it's working, uh, as you go from left to right, you want the right solutions to be better looking than the left ones. So the first cluster, uh, A, looks like it's learning digit zero, this one three, and a little confused with five, and six, and seven, and nine. And what we used is the dumbest possible feature for, for this handwritten data set. And when you do that, other literature also shows that three and five are, are being confused. The feature we use is just uh, 16 by 16. We flatten out into this vector, 260, uh, 256 vector, and just use that as a, as a feature. And when you do that, this is actually a pretty common uh, mistake that this that made when you use this data set. So we also see that here. All right. So Hope I convinced you that the prototypes and subspaces that BCM learned is reasonable. Can I yeah. A question going back. So I thought I understood that the prototype was a specific example. Yes. Uh, but it looks there like the prototype is evolving. So in your generation. Yeah. So this each black boxes are one data point. 
the, these each is one, one data point. This is a data point, this is a data point. But the, it's not evolving, it's, uh, it's, it's, I'm showing you a data point at each GIP sampling iteration. So basically, Does that make somebody sense? wrote a really weird <laughs> early on. Yes, okay. and I verified, actually it really puzzled me. So I verified, and this is there. It's, it's so that's weird, in, that is an example. Yeah, it's an example. Uh, this oh, is an I example. See. Yeah. Oh, I see. That's what confused you. Yes. And these are also yeah. Yeah. Very popular example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the previous slide where you had the recipes, is that yeah. Uh, yeah this one? And uh, remind me of how this is different from just you know, doing clustering with PCA or something like that. And wouldn't you get the right components and, and the clusters, or are these also particular examples? I see. So PCA wouldn't PCA would get you a linear combinational features, right? So it wouldn't give you the subspaces, for example. And it would actually it's it's not it would try it would make sure that all the features that your linear combination are orthogonal, which means that each features that you get, even if you pick the largest coefficient feature, you're probably not going to get the same solution. Although I haven't verified it personally, but it's a very different different sort of approach. Does that answer your question? So definitely. So you're going for. Um not necessarily low rank, but sparse. Yes, sparse and representative, yeah. So going back to the digit example, yeah. um, it seems, or oh, one more slide actually. Yeah. Uh, so it would seem like it's easy to kind of look at that subspace because of the features you chose. Right. Um, but does, it, does your method depend on kind of the feature space to be able to choose features that you know, enable explicability? This is a great question. So yes, so my method assumes that the features, whatever data that you gave me, those features make sense to you. So the example that may not make sense, well, maybe maybe it does. Maybe it does may not make sense is maybe audio clips in the like frequency domain, right? If that's your features, hopefully that makes sense to you. If that doesn't make sense to you, that's the subspaces that VCM will provide it to you. So yes, that's an assumption that we make that features that, that were given to us should make sense to at least like you to you. And in particular, I guess the way you, you laid it out is the way the features were fed to your algorithm was a 256 dimensional vector. So if we'd listed, listed those as our, uh, as our that, that picture would not have made any sense to humans because you, you relayed it back out in the original picture. Form. True, yes, true. So yeah, if we do some feature transformation and then that's the subspace we learn, then that would also be a problem. Unless we invert it back and that still makes sense, right? Yeah. So you were saying you picked the examples for the recipe um, for the first case. Yeah. Um, did you pick a balanced number of um, recipes for each of the categories? I see. Yes, I made sure that they're roughly in the same number, because otherwise it's it's going to be difficult. Okay, I guess that's my next question, is how do you handle cases where, like one of the classic mm -hmm. examples we will study clusters is how we put cluster color space into color names in studies in the 1960s. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And like we have a very defined concept of red, whereas green and blue can sort of, they're right. very vague. Right, right. How would you Right, right. So that would be a very common problem for any clustering algorithms, right? Gaussian mixture model. If two means of these clusters are similar, Gaussian then... Algorithms, but in real world, a lot of the clusters are not balanced. How do you... Mm, I see. In, if like imbalanced data set, how would you do it? I see. Mm, that's a good question. So for mixture models, it relies on data points being at least distinguishable in, in your feature space. So. Uh, it's, it's not particular for the BCM model, but any models that using a mixture model or any kind of naive feature space uh, modeling would have the same problem of, of what you're describing. If features, data points are right next to each other, on the top of each other, then there's no way for us to distinguish. It would need extra work to transform those features to be more distinguishable or, or, or some other method. That would be something perhaps more fundamental to clustering method in general than it is to, you know, but that's a good point. If we could um, kind of map that current eye features to a higher dimension and keep the intu intuition and make it uh, still understandable, that would be that would be really good. Yeah, I guess the related question is um, some things like, for example, uh, when people pick a prototype to represent a particular color, mm -hmm. almost everybody in the world people have surveyed this from like 110 different societies, pick the same red, uh -huh. but people should pick very different blues. Oh, and so how do you deal with that? So that example that you gave me is how people perceive clusters to be different depending on the culture. I see. Or just like 
um, in some clusters, the prototype may not uh, yeah, may be not so good for some or, people. Yeah, or people agree on multiple prototypes. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. I see. So if, uh, right, so in, in your example, we want kind of have multiple prototypes for the blue because a lot of people just don't agree on the prototypes. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see. I can think of very simple extension of the BCM to make that happen. So you basically would need another box on the top of my model here, right here, to learn multiple prototypes. And if that's the case, and, and, and maybe we could automatically also learn a number of prototypes that, that is mixed and you can put uh, a, a non-Bayesian, non non-parametric Bayesian uh, Chinese restaurant processes fancy prior to do that. But yeah, that's an extension that's possible and that's a good point. Great. Okay, so I think I was here, yeah. So the next question that people ask is, okay, well, interpretability is great. It's great if we have it, but what are we, what's the cost? Uh, we show that BCM maintains accuracy. In fact, BCM beats uh, LDA in, in many, many, of the, uh, many of the settings that we tested. The green ones are the BC, BCM, the yellows are, are the LDA. So the way that I evaluate this is, again, uh, in, in, in a few slides back, uh, using the cluster distribution and you combine that with SVM to get the classification accuracy. So we showed that and that's great. Uh, we also did sensitivity, sensitivity analysis. This is basically we have some hyperparameters in BCM. If we change them a little bit, does it make dramatic difference in our classification uh, accuracy? And we show that for a number of, for, for all the values, it does not. So that shows us, that, yeah, we don't have to too worry too much about the hyperparameter values. As long as we set them in, in a reasonable range, reasonable range defined over here, uh, it will, it will, it's pretty robust to that. And that's a function of kind of the amount of training data you have though, right? Mm, some parameters, yes, some parameters, no, yeah. So, for example, bumps like the, the G function bumps how, how we are going to score the similarity between data points and your prototype. Those bumps are not relative to uh, your, your number of data points. But the, the pseudo counts for Dirichlet hyperparameters like alpha or other parameters that relate to the, those Dirichlet, that's a pseudo count for your data set and it will be directly added onto if you compare the collapse skip sampling equation, it will be directly added onto your data set, right? So that will uh, have relation with the number of data points. So is this a lucky coincidence or is there an a priori reason to believe that BCM will outperform LDA? This is a really good question because it really puzzled me when I first got this, like, why is it doing better? That's weird. Uh, so I don't have, you know, proof for why this is better, but one way to explain this is perhaps BCM is a smart regularizer that acts on the solution space that pushes the solution into a better space that does not overfit the data. That's one explanation. All right. So it's a good segue for my next slide. Uh, so we wondered, why is this happening? And this is a graphical explanation of why this might be happening. Think about a posterior distribution that you're trying to sample from. And a level set in that posterior distribution, it, it, it represents all the solutions that are equally good in, in terms of clustering. What we think that BCM is encouraging the solution uh, so the Gibbs sampling steps to do is to move, pushes the solutions to a space where it is good, good clustering results, but at the same time, that clustering results can be well explained using these prototypes and subspaces. And the key of doing that is, uh, the key is that this is only possible because we are performing joint inference over the clustering and the explanation. If we are doing this as a post-processing or any other way of doing this, this may not happen. Yes? So it seems like you would imagine that there should be some way, like you said that it was very robust to parameter choices, hyperparameter choices, but it seems like there should be some thing in there that could tune your bias toward interpretability versus fitting the, the clustering. And that seems like that doesn't seem to be the case. Mm, interesting. Yeah, so if, if this hypothesis, which we have not proven, is correct, then 
it's 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 not the case, right? So that that your comment is about that assumes that there has to be some trade-off. But for this data set we tested and for the settings that we tested, it seems like it just acts like a good regularizer. Okay, so these are these are the collapse skip sampling. So we 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 use collapse skip sampling for the inference. I did not mean to explain all this to you in, in, in detail, but these are the equations that we use. We integrate out uh, variables that we don't need, uh, phi and pi. But you can always, for example, after you got other latent variables, if you are cur if you, if you um, want to know about phi and pi, which we do. Okay, so the last results that I would like to share with you is. Uh, the results on human subject experiment. We want to make sure that this thing that we developed makes sense to humans. One way to show that this makes sense to humans is call your friends, call, call, call your researchers around your lab and ask them, do you like this explanation, right? But what we thought the better way to evaluate this model is to measure the objective performance on a task that requires good understandings of clusters. And that's what we did. We asked humans to be a human classifier. We gave them a new data point, which is uh, recipe data in this case, and show them, I, we didn't show them the name of that dish, like we didn't tell them it was micro, microwave brownie, but we show them the data points, the, 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 the list of ingredients. And then we asked them, we explained each of the clusters using BCM and LDA. So half of the cluster, half of the questions that uh, subjects got were BCM and the half is LDA and the order is randomly chosen. And we asked them to classify this new dish. Where is this new dish belong to? We showed four to six different clusters, and ex all of which are explained using BCM or LDA. All right. So we asked 384 classification questions to 24 people, and the results we got was, was very promising. We, people perform statistically significantly better when they are using BCM. And they, use, they spend roughly the same time solving the problem. So this is preliminary results on, yes, the BCM explanations that is provided by BCM make sense, and it can help humans understand things better. So today I talked about uh, part of my thesis work on making machine learning models that could provide explanations, intuitive explanations to humans about the machine learning results. I showed that Bayesian case model, BCM, performs uh, joint inference on the explanation and clustering. It maintains accuracy uh, and it can provide intuitive explanations that could further improve uh, human understandings about the machine learning results. Yes. Um, so, it seems is the is a part of BCM coming from the fact that because you require these prototypes to be actual examples when you do your sampling, you're jumping uh, across spaces, unlike in mixture models where you have incremental changes. Yes. And which leads to the question: Do you think there is an issue when you have fewer examples? It doesn't appear to be the case in your graph, but when you have fewer prototype examples, would do you think that would cause an issue with BCM? Oh, like fewer clusters. Like you said that, you said to BCM, we want only want to learn two clusters, for example. Or you have only three examples for a cluster, such like the mean of the ah, three points might be a good representative, which is what a mixture model would find. But with BCM, you have to pick one of these three. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I think there are two questions in this. So the first question was, is it, is, it, is it using sort of leveraging the power of the fact that you're, you have to pick the real examples, and second is what happens if there are not that many data points belong to a particular cluster. So to answer your first question, uh, yes, I think that's that's what might be happening. What LDA or other models that uses a mixture model, what happens there is that uh, you you completely ignore for for the computational reasons for, for and reasonable assumptions sometimes oftentimes for real data too, you assume all the features are independent, and we do that too here, but. Indirectly, we kind of capture relations between features because we have to pick a data point. So if there is a data point, there's no data point that feature one and three happens at the same time, then that's going to get a less score because just simply there is no data point, right? So we kind of capture the relation between the features or maybe correlation between features because we are modeling, uh, characterizing clusters using examples. For your second question, 
if because there are three questions. So I think that depends. So if it also depends on how poorly those three data points score for other clusters. So let's say you have three data points in one cluster very far away, and all the other guys are pretty well defined here. Five clusters, 100 data points each, right? Um, I think it depends on how close these guys, three data points are for the rest of the guys. Again, I think it's similar to the regular clustering, uh, challenges in regular clustering algorithms where uh, if, if it's close, it's just gonna be observed by these rest of the people. If it's really, really far and it really scores very poorly on the other clusters when we're doing Gibbs sampling, then it's going to try to form a new cluster. Um, I don't think that because we are using prototypes, it would, it might benefit a little because there is an actual example that could well describe that cluster, but I think same challenge of, of uh, identifying that cluster is going to be there. Yeah, uh, my point was more about the fact that because you're requiring to pick one of these points, the mean of these points would be a better representation than picking any one of these three. Mm, why do you think so? Uh, spread out. Oh, okay, so like if there is this, is picking this might be better. If you had a lot then. of points, then you could potentially get the centroid as your prototype and you're happy. Mm, mm, mm. But if you didn't get the centroid in your prototypes, mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. you're mm. stuck with picking an extreme. That's true, that's true. But I think I can argue that that is, that is true. I think it might, might be poor representation. Like if you calculate the distribution over this and, and the score absolute likelihood might be lower in, in, in the case of picking the prototypes. But in the scheme of like, the, the things, if you have, if that really makes that much difference, picking one data point versus picking the middle, middle, middle of the data points, then you have three data points that are really far away from each other, right? Maybe they shouldn't be in the same cluster to begin with. Okay, so future, yes. One more question. So a lot of the LDA work in um, sort of recent years mm -hmm. has actually been more on um, optimizing the hyperparameters. Like you pick the number of and a number of clusters properly, right, the right. clusters are actually not being better than if you tried, if you had the wrong number of clusters. Right, right, right. right. Um, so, I, so the evaluation you have right now is sort of you pick the, the same N and you compare mm -hmm. it against your DA. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to put that within a hyperparameter setting where mm -hmm. you try to automatically pick N and this ECM still perform better? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I, I, I'm glad you asked the question. So I have not. Answer is that. but. All the really lo lots of literatures on LDA, picking non-parametric business, all the Chinese restaurant processes, Gaussian processes for the optimizing hyperparameters by work by Ryan Adams at Harvard, all of those are applicable to BCM. So picking the right number of, of for the hyperparameters, those techniques are really well studied, widely studied, we can leverage that. But uh, how well does your algorithm sort of What's the right word? Be great if you pick the wrong end. So I guess that's mm. a question. I see, I see. That's a good question. Uh, I don't have a plot here, but I did plot number of clusters with the likelihood. Uh, whether it, it does it, is there a sweet zone that we can pick? Whether uh, avoiding overfitting and underfitting, right? But there, uh, so there exists the, that cluster that that um, pre we see the pretty much the same pattern as LDA. Is what I'm trying to say. So we'll see. We'll see if you pick the larger, too many clusters, it will fit. It it behaves a similar way because the way that we model the underlying data distribution is exactly mixture model. So I don't expect it to be. I haven't tested, but I don't expect it to be dramatically different than other mixture, other generated models that leverages mixture models. Okay. So my future work, and I'm I'm actually it says future work, but I'm currently really actively working on and trying to meet some deadline if I can get to it, uh, is closing this feedback loop between machine and humans. Uh, at the beginning of the talk, I talked about I want to make machine learning models that can be used by humans, and that requires machine learning models to make sense to humans and also can make sense of humans. And this is the making sense of humans part. We want uh, human domain experts, such as disaster responders, uh, to come in and really contribute their domain expert knowledge, years of accumulated experience, or sometimes just even gut feeling, uh, uh, so that the machine learning can also learn from humans. And that's the part that I'm currently working on, interactive machine learning part. So for example, this is a toy example of what might 
we could do, one of the things we could do is if there is a prototype, maybe humans can identify important features. It might be important features for the data. Data is trying to say that this is also important features, or maybe these are important features that humans think, uh, and that, that's also equally valuable. So closing this loop is uh, part of my last piece of my PhD thesis that I'm working on. Very excited about. So that's it for my talk. Thank you. <laughs>